Jacob. I'm reminded of somebody else who fought with God. Rose up against God, strove against God, and God cursed him. And yet when God fought with someone as powerful as Satan, he conquered him. Which brings this great question tonight. When we fight with God, who wins? Who said God? I mean, can I get a hand and see who says God and who says not God in this story? Okay. Who is for God in this story? Who thinks he's going to come out victorious? He's going to win the battle. Okay, we've got a few. We've got a few. Who thinks that man is going to win this battle? Wow, okay, I'm so alone. I know the story, guys. Okay. Genesis 32. A crazy story, but one that is essential to us because it applies as much to us as it does to anything that the Jews would ever face. We see in this a story that begins with where we left off that Laban had come against Jacob. And Jacob had trusted in God and realized that Laban was a caged lion and could do nothing because God wouldn't let him. But in Genesis 32, Jacob is going to face a mightier foe than that. He's going to face God. He will strive against God. And the crazy thing is, is who wins? Genesis 32, starting in verse 1. Now as Jacob went on his way, the angel of God met him. Jacob said when he saw them, this is God's camp. So he named that place Mahanaim. He continues on and he meets his brother. Verse 3. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He also commanded them saying, thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and male and female servants. I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. The messenger returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and furthermore he is coming to meet you and 400 men are with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed and he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. For he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the company which is left will escape. Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your relatives, and I will prosper you. I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. For with my staff only I have crossed this Jordan, and now I've become two companies. Last time we were dealing with Laban and his, his army, but this time it's a greater army. It's Esau's army. And Esau is coming from his own land, Edom, the other name for Esau. And he's coming out with 400 men, and Jacob is once again afraid. So he does the right thing. He runs in the right direction. He's afraid, so he does this. He prays to God. And then he prepares to divide his family. Verses 11 through 16. He he sets apart that which is just an offering to his brother. So that the very first thing that comes to his brother is this offering. And, and, And he waits on one side of this river. And he gets ready and he prepares these different things. He prepares goats. Male goats, female goats, ooze, rams, milking camels, cows, bulls, donkeys. And he prepares these servants so that they pass before it and they appease Jacob. And he goes before and Esau is less angry at Jacob. And then Jacob then sends them over. Verse 17 is when he finally goes over. He commanded the one in front, saying, When my brother Esau meets you and asks you, saying, To whom do you belong, and where are you going? And to whom do these animals in front of you belong? Then you shall say, These belong to your servant Jacob. It is a present sent to my lord Esau. And behold, he also is behind us. Then he commanded also the second and the third and all those who followed the drove, saying, After this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. 
And you shall say, Behold, your servant Jacob also is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. Then afterward I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. He continues with, So the present passed on before him while he himself spent that night in the camp. Now he arose that same night and took his two wives and his two maids and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and he sent across whatever he had. Then Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and four hundred men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids and their children in front, and Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. But he himself passed on ahead of them and bowed down to the ground seven times till he came near to his brother. This is the same Jacob who was so overconfident last week. He was so brave against Laban and those who were coming against him. But when Esau is coming against him, Esau is blessed of the Lord too. And he, and he has this fear that God will not protect him. And that night he waits on one side of the bank alone while his family's on the other. And the angel of the Lord, the very messenger that speaks for the Lord, the one that is referred to so many times as God, because he represents God. Because God being spirit has a representative in the Old Testament. And this same angel comes representing God. And Jacob does something that none of us would have predicted. He wrestles with God. Verse 24. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the sock of his thigh, so that the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he was wrestling with him. Then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go, unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Peniel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of the hip. He is fighting with the angel of God. Face to face, he's coming before the angel of God, and the angel destroys his hip. He is in a huge amount of pain in this story. And in the middle of all that, in the middle of this pain, what does he say? I will not let you go unless you bless me. And in doing so, he is then given this blessing that fits us as much as anything. I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. And he changed his name to Israel. And the term that gets so much guff is right here. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. There was a wrestling match between God and man. And who won? Be fair here. This is in the Bible. Who won? Man. It's almost uncomfortable to say, isn't it? You see why I dressed as a demon tonight? Red tie, black, you know, you get the point. No, the idea is that in our mind, this seems so contrary to everything because we're thinking in power. We're thinking in terms of power and we're like, God is so powerful that man could never prevail against him. And the problem is, that's not a good way to look at God. That's never been a good way to look at God. As going, he's just powerful. He's distant. He's far away. You know, don't want to mess with him. I got a problem. Let's avoid him. He's that angry parent that we avoid when there's a problem. He's that strict dictator that he's going to get you if he finds out. And taking that view makes this story the weirdest story ever. And we go, man can't beat God in a wrestling match. As powerful as Satan was, he couldn't even come close. And yet a mere man prevails against God. 
And what did he do that he prevailed against God is the question. He says what he did. He says, I will not let you go. And in that is the lesson for us. Too often we think of God in, the, in these terms of just, well, you know, I'll keep that, I'll deal with that. You know, that's my problem. But if Israel is allowed to wrestle with the angel of God, the very representative of it, he says the face of God is how you describe this angel. And he is allowed to wrestle with that. And today we are so afraid of wrestling with God. He's too high and mighty. He's too big. We can't wrestle with God. And what we do is we try to keep things and they become ours. And we have issues with God and we don't take them to God. We want to cry out, God, what are you doing? This doesn't make sense. And we're like, no, we're not allowed to say that. We struggle with God and we're so afraid of just going to him with it. And yet, Israel is blessed not because he listens to God. He doesn't. God said, let me go. And Jacob said, no. And I want you to get that there is a huge difference between us disobeying God and coming to God honestly. They may sound the same at times. There may be times when we come to God and it sounds like we are mad. We are upset. We don't understand. There's too much going on. It's overwhelming us. And so we decide, you know, we've got this wrestling match. I'm just going to wrestle with it myself. Because if I wrestle with God, he'd win. He'd see my sin for what it is, and he would condemn me and hate me and reject me. And, and, and this same God who is so powerful goes... Jacob, you wrestled with me and won. And we go, Psh. and most of you were wrong when I asked the question. I said, who's going to win between a fight between man and God? Everybody said the good church answer, Jesus. Um, it's true. But the problem is, that is only if God wants to win. What if God's biggest design is not to win everything? What if he wants something more than just to win? What if the prize of losing is greater than the prize of winning? A God who says, cling to me. Who says, I love you. He says, none are righteous, and yet he loves all of us. And the idea that God losing may be God winning. Because what happened, God got exactly what he wanted from Jacob. God got what he wanted from Jacob. God wanted Jacob to wrestle with him. He blessed him for it. You don't see blessing for negative things. You get blessed for positive things in the Bible. Which leads us to the conclusion that Jacob wrestling with God was the best thing he could do. Now, Jacob is scared right here. He's already striven against Laban and finally gotten away from that bad situation. And he's like, oh, breath of fresh air. Now I got to face Esau. Now I've got a new army facing me. And he's overwhelmed and he prays to God. And once he gets... To God, he won't let him go. He tells him he will not let him go without being blessed. And this is so contrary to everything we think about God. Because too often we think we are something great to strive with God. We've all heard, we have this image of Satan versus God. And it's just Satan rises up, wrestles with God, and God cursed him to the earth. 
And so we get this idea and we, we put it with ourselves and we say, we're not allowed to struggle with God. We're not allowed to say, God, I just don't get it. What you're doing doesn't make sense to me. And the worst decision you can ever make in your life is not to wrestle with God. Is to say, God, I got a problem with you. I'm going to hide it and act like it's not real. I, I'm not going to wrestle with you, God. I, I, I really struggle with what you're doing. I, I don't understand this situation. But God, you know, all things work together for the good of those. And I just start quoting just snippets of scripture until I can just try to, you know, pl plaster over a problem. And instead of just dealing with the real problem and saying, I don't want snippets. I don't want glossing over the problem. I want to fight with you, God. I want to come before your presence and fight with you and you to say, you are blessed. Provide the answer because you are the kind of God who wants us to strive with you. The kind of God who doesn't have to win every little match. That's human. That's so human thinking. Because we always think if you know you go to play a game, you go into a fight, you go boxing, wrestling, whichever your sport is. I guess football's a sport here, right? Yeah, I guess, whatever. You don't want to lose. Nobody goes out there and, guys, let's pray we're going to lose today. Nobody even does that. I know they pray before, but I think they pray to win, which is kind of weird. But no, matter, no, no human comes out to a battle and goes, I hope I lose today. I mean, losing's as good as winning because somebody's got to lose. That should be me. But that is not our God. Because there's no way we can certain this and say, well, God was unable to prevail against Jacob. It doesn't say that. It just says that Jacob prevailed. It doesn't say anything about the weakness of God. It says more about the strength of God. That this same God who has no reason whatsoever to come down to our level does. Repeatedly. Th this same God who we don't want to present with our disagreement with him, but he's already concerned about their hairs on our head. How many of y'all brushed your hair this morning? Seriously. How many of you brushed your hair? How many of you ever look at the brush? I don't because it freaks me out. But if you look at the brush, there's always these hairs. I don't care if you're five years old, you're already shedding. I don't know. Right? And there's always hairs and you pull out these hairs. And generally, I don't care. I just hate having to clean my own brush out. But yet God says he's concerned about that hair that I'm about to throw away because I really don't care about anymore. Now, if I lose all of them, I'll notice. But if I lose a couple, I don't care. And when God talks about it, he says he cares about that. And too often in the middle of everything, Christians are the worst people around. If, if you've been to a funeral, Christians say some of the meanest things ever. And we don't mean it. We just have to have all the answers. Right? Because God gave us the answers. We have all the answers. We understand perfectly. So therefore, since God gave us the word, we get everything and everything we know. And we're like, it was just their time. That's a big leap between I read the Bible to God said it was their time. Because of the names written in the Bible, I haven't read any of yours. Sorry. In the words written in the Bible, it never said anything like that. Or we use these cliches, God needed another angel. What? Admit you've heard these at funerals. Funerals, I don't know. At least atheists are just like, I don't get it. Okay, that, that's a good answer. And too often we're so afraid of just saying, we don't know. We don't get it. And when somebody's hurting, saying, let's pray. God, what are you doing? I have prayed so many times that exact prayer. God, what are you doing? This doesn't make sense. Why are they hurting? What are you doing? Why don't you show up like you're supposed to? And everybody goes, well, you're not supposed to talk like, to God like that. No, I'm supposed to keep that inside. Let it fester and dwell until this hatred builds up for God on the inside. And then I'm distant from God. And we have this great relationship where we're not talking. 
If you've ever studied marriage, the number one problem in most marriage counseling is communication. They just quit talking. You ball it up. You don't want to tell the other one what's wrong. So you ball it up. And no less is it true with God. We do. We gloss over things instead of dealing with them. And saying, God, sometimes it doesn't make sense to me. I'm not letting go of you until you give me satisfaction. Until I'm satisfied with you, I'm not letting go of you. I'm not going to quit pestering you and coming before you. Jesus taught us to pray, and sometimes he teaches us to pray in a really weird way. He said, keep pestering. It's like this woman. She was poor, so the judge didn't really care. So she kept coming to the judge. She kept coming to the judge. She kept coming to the judge. And finally, the judge, the evil judge who doesn't care because she's poor, listens to her. Jesus, you, you realize your parable was about God, right? Not some unrighteous, uncaring judge. But yet, in the story of teaching us to pray... He taught us to pray in such a way that we just keep coming back. We keep struggling with God. And if we looked at God and honestly said, God, there are certain things I just don't get. Because I don't, I don't care where you are, you're going to struggle with something. We not, may not be facing 400 people after we just faced 200 people, after we just faced 14 years, 21 years of servitude. We may not be in that situation, but most of us are going to come to a point where we can either hide from God or fight with him. We can either hold on to God and say, I will not let you go. I don't understand. You don't make sense. You're freaking me out right now. I'm kind of angry at you, but hold on to God the whole time. Or we can say, well, I mean, it's, it's okay. It's okay. And slowly, slowly, slowly take those steps away from God. Because nobody says, I'm going to leave God. Boom, gone. You know, I've committed my life to God. I want to follow him. But tomorrow I'm leaving. It's not how it works. The way that it works is one step. One incident where we get into a situation and it doesn't make sense and we're angry at God and we go, we're not allowed to yell at him. If there was an eviler teaching in the church, it would be that there are things we shouldn't bring to God. More people have gone away because they've been told, no, you can't go to God with that. Here's the answer. It's God's will. Deal with it. No, because in this, we have God saying one thing and then blessing him because he resisted. He said, let me go. Jacob said, no, you will bless me. And that may be where some of us are and then it may be where some of us are going to be. And that is real Christianity. Christianity is not a religion. It's so far from a religion. It's all about a relationship. And I don't care what relationship you're talking about. There are fights in every relationship. Me and my wife never fight. Somebody believes that? Okay. Somebody believes that. <clears throat> I have siblings. Obviously, we never fight, right? Now, obviously, right? Y'all know about siblings. They never fight. It's the rules. Parents never fought with our parents or our children or any of that, right? Ever. But if you told me that you have never fought with any of those, I would tell you you don't have a relationship with any of those. And when you have a relationship with God, it consists of sometimes wrestling with God. And really struggling with, God, I, it doesn't make sense. I, I'm, I'm doubting you. I, I don't get this situation. I'm upset. I'm angry. It doesn't matter the emotion. Because we have a God who is willing to come down to our level. When we're hurting and be with us. 
and a God who doesn't have to win because he's God. He has nothing to prove. Romans 6, verse 3 through 5. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. So as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Tonight we know that God has offered his son and that is exactly what we've been talking about. God coming down and coming down to our level and we know that Jesus tells us that we must confess that he is Lord Repent of our sins. Dying to that old self, being buried with him in baptism so that we are united with him. So that we're raised to walk with him and struggle as in any relationship with him. So that one day we get to be united completely with him. When we understand perfectly and that which is perfect is revealed. If there's anybody who does not have that hope tonight, or anybody who needs prayers, or anybody who wants to submit to the eldership here, we ask you to come now as we stand and as we sing.